Um, next slide, please. So we have a huge collection, um, 80 million specimens, and we want to digitize them all. Um, but it's slow. At the moment, it's a very manual process, and it's going to take decades and de <clears throat> sorry, decades to complete. And many of the tasks are highly repetitive and really suited to automation. Next slide, please. Um, so last year, we got a UK government grant um, to prototype our robotic digitization processes. And we bought one of these, a Techman TM5900 robot. Um, it's after a lengthy evaluation process. Um, many suppliers were invited to tender, and we, um, we chose this one. It's a, a lovely bit of kit. It's got six degrees of freedom, so that's the number of um, joints it's got and how precise you can be with the movements. Um, it's got nearly one meter in reach, so we can re reach across the insect drawers. Um, it can only lift about 4K. Um, so there's many stronger robots, but it's more than enough for our needs. Um, and it's got this lovely hand-guided um, processing, so you can move and click it into, process, into position, and that's how you can actually program it. Um, but what set this apart for us, it has this built-in robot vision, and so it has like an AI-first approach. And it allows us to um, develop our own PyTorch models, models and plug it into the robot so we can develop very sort of exact um, workflows. Um, it also has a very nice, uh, simple workflow engine behind it. And so it's designed for people being new to robotics, which is, yeah, perfect for us. Um, so we can get up and running quickly and we can prototype things really rapidly. So what we've done is we've come up, come up with three use cases. Um, and these aren't always the easiest things to digitize, but they're where we think will have the most impact. Uh, for example, um, slides um, would be very easy to do, but we already have very efficient workflows in place. So um, yeah, so we're looking at pinned insects and herbarium sheets in the first instances. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, great, the videos work. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is our first use case. Um, and on the left, you can see um, Alice, which is like a multi-camera setup. So you take photos of a pinned insect, and then you glue those specimens um, together, the specimen labels, to allow you to read it. And Vince is going to be talking about that uh, later in the week. Um, but rather than trying to reconstruct the labels from uh, those um, composite images, um, we can use our robotic arm. We can mount a camera on the arm and then zoom in on the bits of the label to make that bit readable. Uh, the robot software has automatic OCR as well, so we just have to train the model to find the best bit of the text, and then the, um, the actual built-in software will do the work. Um, the advantage of this use case is it's non-invasive, so there's no manipulation of the specimen and less risk of damage. Uh, the negative, uh, the drawback of this is you can't actually attach a barcode to the, um, to the specimen pin, and that's often part of the digitization process. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is um, use case two. So, and this is de-pinning the specimen from the, um, from the drawer. Um, so you use the gripper to take the, uh, the pinned insect out of the drawer, and then, um, yeah, as you can see, the robot doing it here. Um, we still need to decide how to do the imaging with this. I mean, might implement this as a cobot, so working alongside the digitizers to uh, place the item inside into the Alice software that you saw before, or we combine it with the, um, the, uh, the first use case. So you re remove the specimen from the drawer, move it to a staging area, and then image all around with a uh, camera mounted on a uh, robot arm. Um, in this example, it's using pre-programmed uh, pin locations, so not using uh, computer vision to actually detect the pins. Um, and it does look um, quite scary, having this sort of big gripper coming down near these delicate specimens, I know. And it does have force detection built in, but yeah, that force detection is not going to be uh, enough to stop um, you crushing one of those. <laughs> um, next, next slide, please. Okay. Um, 
but it's not as dangerous as it looks. So these cobots are designed to be working alongside a human. So you, def you define boxes that they're allowed to go into. And so for working with these drawers, we can define a um, absolute ground zero. And that robot arm is not allowed to move within that. It will terminate its movement as soon as it moves into that space. Um, and so we can use um, we can use that. So the, the gripper is going to stop as soon as it gets anywhere near any of those specimens. Um, so it's, it's not at risk of crushing them. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, and the next, the next stage in the process is to develop com computer vision models. So this is a uh, YOLO object detection uh, model um, and developed by my colleague and a student from UCL. Um, and there are still a few errors, as you can see, where it's like sort of, um, it's uh, uh, predicting uh, conjoined specimens, which is gonna be a problem when you're coming to like grip it. But uh, there are improvements we can make. So we've got like a 3D camera for visualizing the entire scene around it. Um, and then you can, um, and then you can detect the pins exactly where they are, and we'll plug that into the to, into the um, into the gripper. Um, and we had Q come and visit us a few weeks ago, and Nikki Nicholson, who's um, here this week, suggested using magnetic detection for the uh, the pins. And that's um, yeah, definitely something we're going to be trying. And it illustrates how flexible these these robot systems are. So there's a Modbus control box, and we can add new interfaces, new detectors, and new cameras to. Uh, to build these very sort of complex uh, digitization workflows. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and use case three, herbarium sheets. Um, again, we need to be a little bit more uh, a different approach. And this is using a vacuum gripper uh, because with paper and slides, um, using a, uh, a mechanical gripper, it's just a bit too, uh, a bit too dangerous. Um, and you can also 3D print grippers. Um, so for different parts of the, the collection, we can have completely customized um, interfaces. Uh, next slide, please. So those are the first three use cases we, we defined at the start of the project. Um, but we, we do actually have our first production project already working. And this is working with real life specimens. And these are fossilized shark teeth. Um, and so when the paleo people at the museum found out that we had this robot arm, they were really excited because they've got all of these boxes of of teeth <laughs> lying around um, and they need to be sorted through and imaged and they're perfect for our first uh, prototype project because they're tough they're hard for us to damage um, next slide please and so in this video um, you can see the rover arm actually um, sorting through one of the boxes in this collection so what it's doing here is um, it's kind of going through and pulling them out by the size of the um, of the, uh, the, of the tooth. And on the left-hand side, you can see the actual servoing the robot is doing. And um, as it, you can see, it's sort of twisting around a bit as well. And what it's trying to do is actually sort of predict um, or like detect the line, the axis of the tooth, so it can grip it properly. We've also modified the, um, the gripper in this. And um, this is the other gripper, by the way. Um, so it's got two little soft pads just to minimize any, um, any damage we might cause to the specimen. Um, but this is in production now, and this is our first um, digitization project. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so next steps. Um, we want to complete the uh, shark teeth digitization project, and having that, that first project complete will be a huge step. Um, the first um, robotic digitization workflow at the museum. Um, and then the next step after that is to integrate some of those new uh, computer vision models. So we're actually programming the arm and not just building things with the AI interfaces um, and getting those first two use cases that I introduced at the start working. Um, we are going to be using mock specimen drawers. And the key part of this project is to, to validate everything in safety first. Um, I haven't shown any slides, but we've actually got a big red button attached to the robot arm. So as soon as it kind of uh, does anything that risks damaging, damaging a specimen, we can hit the button and stop everything. Um, and it's when we don't have to be there alongside the robot, keeping an eye on it, that you'll start seeing that sort of revolution in digitization because this can just run for 24 hours on its own, just digitizing everything. Um, but we do also need to gain the trust of the uh, curators at the Natural History Museum to, um, 
yeah, I mean, we have a duty of care to the collection and one error, one specimen damaged, we will lose that trust. And so this is a very careful, very iterative process. And it's hard, but we want to digitize at that scale. And this kind of innovation will revolutionize that approach. Um, and I hope other institutions will start following this route and more, the more people doing it and the more sharing experiences, we can drive innovation forward in this space. And if anyone's in London and would like to come and have a look at our new innovation lab and see what we're doing with the robot, yeah, drop me a line. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was super interesting. Um, I'm just going to check and see if there's any online questions. I don't think that there are. So there are quite a few hands going up in the room. Please remember to introduce yourself first. Here, Deb, you can go first. Very quickly, you mentioned options for using the robot. Could it work with something like the lightning bug, where the robot would pick it up and then put it into the lightning bug? Yeah. I think it would work with that? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. For those of you, we can Google that. And did I say I'm Deb Paul? I forgot. <laughs> but yeah, it's very easy to program. And you sort of... Um, put it into any any different apparatus and you can build triggers to um to, to fire once it's in position um y'all can come find somebody here who knows about lightning bug i'm one but there's clearly one more right. to tell you what that is uh, hi i'm leon elder from anaki fenua hi. i was just wondering if you could tell us how much the robot costs um am i allowed to do that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the grant was for um uh, 50,000, and I think it was, um, came out about 38, 42, yeah, 1,000 English pounds, yeah. Um, but that was um, with, um, so the arm itself was about 20,000, and then we've got two grippers, we've got 3D vision, and then the AI components on top of that, um, and then training as well. So, yeah, it's about 42,000. I will come to you next. Okay. So I, when you showed the video of the uh, robot reading the labels, it looked like there was a stack of labels and it looked like it couldn't read the lowest one in the stack. Is that when you have to resort to unpinning the specimen from the... Um, yeah, possibly. But um, there probably will be other ways of doing it because um, you can... I mean, yeah, I mean, it's an unknown. We've only just started working with it. But whether or not you can actually sort of move the labels a little bit with the arm, with a camera mounted alongside, mm. it might be able to do that because actually detecting the labels with a computer vision model, yeah, is, is, is quite a simple process. So, yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, Shelley Jones from Perth. Um, I'm curious about the sucker arms for the herbarium specimens. How does that work? Um, we haven't got one yet. So, oh, um, but, <laughs> how disappointing. I know, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, but we should have put that in the um, when, we, when we paid for it. But it's just like a little, um, you adjust the flow, and it's just like a little um, little vacuum sucker. Yeah, yeah. And that was a little mini one. And you get ones with like sort of two, four, six, eight suckers for lifting heavier things. Yeah, but it's lots and lots of different grippers you can customize your robot with. So what happens if you have fragments on your, your herbarium sheet? They get sort of suckered up and then... Yeah, but we, we do. <laughs> but you would be able to um, detect where the actual specimen is on the sheet. So you're only targeting the paper elements of it. But, but yeah. Uh, ben, yeah, uh, great presentation. Really enjoyed it. Paul Fleming's here from the Australian Museum. Uh, in terms of the cost of the machine, uh, what is the the salary or the human cost in terms of programming it and uh, making it uh, fit for purpose for a particular collection? Like, have you got ten programmers, one programmer, three <laughs> programmers? Yeah, what, is that more than the machine, or is it less than the machine? Um, we don't have any dedicated programmers, so it's just within my um, AI team. So three of us got trained on it, um, and it's it's quite a simple thing to program. It's all just Python and um, PyTorch, and so we're confident we'll be able to do it with it just within the team. Yeah, but having another person just dedicated on the robot would be good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, th thanks, Ben, for your talk. Um, can I? Have we got time? 
Yeah. Yeah, we do. We have uh, a few more minutes. Right. Well, don't tell yeah. me how many minutes because I'll use it exactly. Um, <laughs> I did visit and the, the shark tooth sorting was, was really great to see. Thank you. Um, it follows on from Paul's question, actually. How transferable do you think the, the kind of the processes that you're building on this arm and the, and the, and the models would be to other models of arm? You know, how much could we share code and techniques between different organizations? Yeah, it's, um, I don't see why we can't just do it completely open. Um, the, the, the software on the robot itself is closed source, but all of the, all the PyTorch model, models will develop will be open source, like everything we do at the museum. And you can export all of the workflows and share those. So if we got a, um, a workflow that would be useful for other institutions, we can just publish it online. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll be writing papers and publishing everything to go with the, uh, with the uh, workflows. Um, and we do have a question online. Um, so you think it should be possible to build similar robot arms in local universities with mechanical engineering programs? To actually build the robots. Um, to build the robot arms? Yeah, like the physical ones. Um, possibly. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a um, mechanical engineer, but um, maybe people can build robot arms like that. I don't see why not, yeah. Yeah, 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 and and the um, the actual hardware costs of um, of actually purchasing a robot like that. There's this wasn't the cheapest one. It's um, they're, they're, the cost of these things have come down so much over the last few years. Sorry. Oh, hi, I'm Nicole from Biodiversity Heritage Library Australia. I've spoken to lots of people who have automatic literature digitization. I'm wondering about your error rate, the whole losing trust of the curators. So I've spoken to digitization projects, literature, where they have automatic page turners. They lose about one, like one in 100 or one in 300 items might get damaged, um, you know, which is actually apparently a lower rate than humans would damage the books. Right. So I'm wondering if you have a set, like I don't, you know, is it one specimen gets damaged, you lose the trust of the curators, or is it like do you have an error rate that's acceptable? The, I'm, I don't think we're at that stage the yet. The time to versus, that. you know, save so much time with this. Is it is it worth damaging the occasional specimen? Possibly. But um, <laughs> I think, <laughs> if, I mean, as a, um, a non-curator, I'd say yes. But, I mean, if you're talking about, like, a type specimen within the museum, then, yeah, we definitely wouldn't be able to, like, damage that. So no, I think no, we no, have to actually. I mean, this is the thing. They don't do rare books with these automatic machines. They do PhD theses or things that they yeah. have multiple copies of. So the list... Yeah. You know. No, I think we need to make sure that we build in so that we can actually sort of guarantee that the, the to have a zero error rate. And we can do that, I think, with the sort of safety safety precautions. That and making slows sure. you down by 50% or something. I think that'd be worth it, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I think we're out of time for questions now. Uh, thank you very much, Ben. Cool. Thank you. Um, any further questions can go on Slack, I think. The next speaker is Alan Stenhouse, 